Welcome back to this video 7 in the series of building the coaling tower. Stay tuned. So like I said, welcome back. Thanks to all my new subscribers for joining my channel out there. I hope that you'll learn how to do some scratch building or, you know, by watching me, maybe not how not to do some things. Uh, but we are here to continue on to the coaling tower. You know, I opened up a whole can of worms with a lot of miscellaneous small parts in last week's video. And we're going to continue on with all that and see how much further we can get in this week's video. So let's just jump into this. Now we're going to backtrack a little bit and continue working on these sanding facilities on this end. I'm getting way ahead of myself with other stuff. There's actually still some painting and some small things to do underneath of that, which I didn't want to get this far ahead. So anyway, we're going to backtrack. And, you know, one of the next steps on the sanding facilities is to actually add the ladders that go up to those platforms on either end. And I went through several different ladders and I found a couple that, you know, I think these were steel ladders. These are actually wood that I found a kit, but you know, they look good and they're small and the details nice on them. So I, I cut these to size just by holding them up there in place. And then I tape them down to this board and just like I do everything else, I go outside and rattle can them and, you know, paint them black. Now there, there's a couple of places at the top where they attach to those platforms I'm going to have to scrape the paint off of so I can get uh, good glue on them because I want the plastics to melt to each other. And you can see because of those strips that I added for bracing under the tower, I needed to just put a brace or an extra piece of plastic under these to raise the bottom of those up to the right height as well. And I just come back and glue both of those two ladders into place onto the front of each of those platforms. Now these would have had, you know, several braces holding these to the tower and they're definitely delicate without something bracing them. So I'm going to come back and add two of these to where the uh, abutment is on either end of the walls on either side of the ladder. And I, you know, looking at it and just handling it a little bit I decided that's really just not quite enough and in real life I think there was another brace or two above that so I come back and add this extra brace halfway up from between that bottom one and the platform and I do this on the both sides of each of those two ladders and you know it, it after I get these on there, it actually it seems pretty solid. I don't, I don't think this is going to break off quite as readily, so I'm still going to be very careful with it, but at least they're on there. Now as I'm doing this, I'm also coming back and working more on the paint. Uh, you know, I would kind of left all this, just a first coat on some of it in the last video, but I come back and start working on all that. And then I start cutting these parts for the handrails. On either side of those two platforms, there was handrails for safety on either side of those. So I just cut these to three foot and the widths of the uh, platforms and come through and make four of these and just glue them together, then flip them over and glue them again because this is just real tiny plastic. It, it doesn't want to, you know, it's it very fragile, I guess is the term I should use. And I just glue these onto this board as well and go outside and use the same spray paint and paint them black like I do everything else. Now I do scrape a little bit of the paint off the bottoms on one side of these because where they glue onto those platforms, I want them to get you know good glue. So here you can see the first one on the first side and you know that worked out okay. The uh, the funnel that goes out to move the sand out to the locomotives has room that it could have moved up and down so this doesn't look like you know it would have caused any problems with the mechanics of any of this and so I just add one to one side and add one to the other platform as well and then come back and add a second one and here you know it's just duplicating what I did on that other platform on this one, adding the first side on first and letting that set up really well and coming back and adding the other side. 
Now I wish I had, you know, pre-painted more of the platform put up before I put it on there, even the braces holding the ladders in place, but I just, I wanted to get good glue on those. So, I, you know, it's just very tedious to come back with a very small brush and get into all this stuff without getting black on everything else. And the angle braces underneath, I still have to get a little done on, but you know, it's getting there. Now remember in the last video I also started these culling chutes on this side but one of these I had gotten gloss paint on instead of flat paint so I'm coming back here and I'm just going to go ahead and put flat paint on that and work on something else while that's drying and, and setting up so I can come back and work on this more later. Now in the last video as well, I had started cutting the walls out for this little mechanical building off of one side of the tower. You can see here where those the, the stairs and the ladders come down to the roof of that building and then go on to the ground. Here you can see the two holes in the wall of the cooling tower where the cables originally went through, although the cables are not in this picture. But you know, it, it just gives me a good idea of the building. It, you know, it was painted white in that picture. And I had the walls to this point in the last video. I had put 45s on all the upright corners so that I could glue these together. The windows, everything was cut out and everything was cleaned up. So I'm just going to come through and start putting these together. And I just used the square lines on my uh, protection pad for my desk and use that as a guide to glue the corners of these together. And I just do two sides, you know, and two sides uh, uh, separate from each other on this because there's still some other things I want to do before I totally form the walls. And, you know, the corners on these are just not real solid. So I found some uh, angle plastic and I'm going to come back and just cut these slightly shorter than the walls. And I'm going to come back and glue those inside those corners just to strengthen that corner so that I don't have a problem with it later on with my fumbly fingers and, you know, breaking things apart where I shouldn't be. Now the windows were nine pane windows. I have these old uh, set of Mullins from, uh, I think they're out of an old Walther's kit or something. And they're really kind of a little larger than what I would like the Mullins to be. But I'm going to go ahead and I just cut these out of, you know, I think these were 12 pane windows. And I just cut these all out of those 12 panes down to the size where they would work in these walls. And I glue those into place. And once I have those into place, then I can come back and glue the two sections of walls together to form the basic full square of the building. Now the roof on this was also a concrete roof and it overlapped the building by five inches. And the outside edges of this were about, you know, five to six inches tall. In the middle of it, it said nine inches. And my measurements are slightly off on that, but I cut all four of these pieces that would have supported the outside edge of the roof. And I'm coming back and gluing those onto the outside of the building because, like I said, it overlapped the building by about five inches. So whatever the thickness of this building, this plastic is, which is probably closer to six inches, but I'm just going to go ahead and come back and glue those all the way around the building. Now the corners and where these meet in the roof corners as well just had little tiny slight gaps in these. So, you know, I've pictured this before. I used to use green stuff to fill gaps and stuff on buildings and actually I like the product better. It's just that it dried out and got hard too quick on me. And I like this nylon spackle. So I just come back and I'm adding those into some slightly open joints and corners. And then I can come back and file these down later on. Once I have that in place, you know, I want to get the glass and the walls in these. So prior to putting the glass in there, I need to paint all these mullins in the windows. So I come back with flat black paint and just go ahead and paint all those. Now I need to get the roof on this thing and you know the plastic I'm going to use is just real thin for sale signs that you get for like 99 cents, but they are really thin. So I'm going to put some support in the center here. So I find this real thick piece of strip of ex, you know, extra plastic I had from another project and I come back and I, there isn't much of a grade to the change in the peak of this but I just file this and sand this down to get a peak in the middle of it slightly so it'll work. 
And when you're filing the plastics, you know, this is just a tool here you're going to need because you're going to have to clean out your files frequently, and it's just made for cleaning out files. But once I get, the, you know, that uh, groove down to that uh, angle on either side, I just come back and glue that in place in the center of this peak. And like I said, I'm just using some of these old for sale signs, which are really, really thin plastic. And I just cut this basically to the right size by turning the building upside down on it and marking where it was and then cutting the plastic. Now I cut this a little bit large because after I glue it down, I'll come back and glue, trim it so it's exactly flush with all the sides. And then I apply the glue to it and just, you know, I have a bunch of these old lead weights. I don't, that, that's just what I use for weighting things down when glue is drying. And I just put a bunch of these on top so I can come back and glue that in place. Now once the roof is glued on, you know, I just I measured the windows while it was sitting there drying and came back and found some of this uh, clear styrene. And I just cut windows that are oversized. And what I use on this is the clear Gorilla Glue in case I get any in the opening that, you, you know, once it dries clear you really won't notice it on the styrene that much. But here you can see the oversized pieces that I cut and I just put a few drops of that glue around the outside edges and lay them and press them into place over top the mullins. Now once that's all in place and that's dried a little bit, I come back and I'm just, you know, I want to add a little bit more glue and a second round of glue to all this from the inside on that roof. And then I come back, like I said, and trim all that to match that outside area and do a little bit of filing. Because I want this, once it's painted, to look like a solid slab of concrete and not layered pieces. Now to paint this, I'm just going to use this real cheap terracotta concrete colored paint. And I, I pick these up for like 99 cents when they're on sale or something like that. They're real cheap paints. And I just use these makeup sponges for dabbing it on. I don't want to use a brush because I don't want you to see brush, you know, streak, streaks through the paint. And I think by using this, you know, a sponge like this and dabbing the paint on, you get more of a texture that looks more like concrete. Now the open cells in this are a little bit, you know, big, so the texture might be a little exaggerated, but after the second coat, you can see, you know, it, it's got a good texture and it looks more like concrete. It also gives you nice uneven tones. Now after that coat, I come back and I look at this and, you know, I can see there's some gaps and stuff in some of this. So I'm going to come back and use that spackle that I use and, you know, I just turn a blade upside down in one of my X-Acto handles and use that kind of as a spatula, add a little bit of water to it and, and just fill in all those small gaps. And once those are filled and painted again, you, you know, it, it looks more like a solid piece and a bunch of small pieces of plastic glued together. And I do come back and just touch up the black paint because where I dabbed that paint on, I got a little on the mullins around the outside and, the, you know, the, in the windows. So I just come back and touch that up with black paint. I just, you know, people have asked me about the powders that I use for weathering. So, you know, basically I just use what's cheap. I go and find a, a cheapest set of these multicolored chalk pastels. You know, and there's every color just about of the rainbow in here. So you can use them for multiple stuff. Now these don't work as good as, uh, you know, the powders that are specifically made for weathering because they don't adhere quite as well. But, you know, basically all I do with these, though, is I have this little multi-area container, and I take sandpaper block, and I just use these and scratch them on the sandpaper block and get enough in there to use for a project. Now, I could go ahead and fill these up, but I just usually get enough each time for the project that I have. And then I come back with a brush and just clean that off down into the container. And then I have chalks, and you can mix the colors and, you know, play with it however you want to. The black and this color here, I kind of, you know, the black I use just to weather and make dusty everything. And these oranges and bright colors like this, I use more on metals where the joints are to use for rust and stuff. And basically, I just use a real big color, uh, or a big open end brush and dry brush this onto the areas that I want to put it on.
So there you have this week's video of building the cooling tower. Uh, you know, I still haven't had snow and serious bad weather set in yet, so I've still got a lot of outside projects going on. Uh, you know, I decided, I mean, most of you probably don't understand baby plants, but I've been making babies, basically. Um, uh, through the year, I do a lot of cuttings off of shrubs and stuff to start new baby plants and root them and grow them on. And, uh, you know, I've never in the past done a lot of winter production from what's called hardwood cuttings. And this year, I just decided that I'm going to expand my thinking into doing more of that than I ever have in the past. So every day I go out and do cuttings and try to produce some plants. So, you know, that's one thing I hadn't counted on doing through the winter, and it's taking a little time. And also, I picked up some, some side work inside. I did construction work for years and years, and I have friends that have rental properties and you know, homes and various stuff, and they just need some inside work done through the winter. So I said, well... You know, I'd help them out. There's not a lot of people that want to work in today's world, so I'm going to help them out and do some inside work, just draw work, painting, you know, whatever, uh, fixing door hinges, whatever needs to be done, glass work. Uh, so anyway, that's going to take some time that I hadn't planned on being gone. During January and February, I normally don't go outside and do a lot. I'm in here and building and, you know, getting ahead several weeks on my videos during that time. Uh, but I'm still working on a work to week to week basis with getting these out there for you. So, you know, all that being said, uh, that, you know, that I'm just accomplishing as much as I can in my time during the week. And, the, you know, I've tried, like I said before, 15 to 20 minute videos is really what I like putting out there for people to watch. It doesn't help me much with my view time when it comes down to being monetized later on. but. You know, when I go to watch videos, I like short, sweet, to the point videos. And, uh, you know, a lot of that's just what I think most people like to watch. So in any case, I did get, you know, that building about done to the point, except for, for scratch building the doors, which we'll do in the next segment of this. But, you know, if you're, if you're intimidated for some reason about scratch building which I, I don't understand that most people think it's it's extremely hard oh my god what am I getting into but you know it's not that hard and you can see by watching this video I mean, it's not perfection but it's a neat small concrete building it's small it you know I don't have a lot of wrapped up in this material wise it's not gonna cost me much of anything Actually, the materials I just have left over from other projects and stuff, so it's not going to cost me anything at all. You know, it's just a freebie little building. And, you know, it's exactly or as exact as I'm going to make it, you know, like the one that was the original building there. And it'll serve the purpose rather well. Um, so, you know, it's just something simple to do. If you're, if you're intimidated, jump out there with something small like this and just play around and learn. You know, it, it's all just, it's all in a learning curve, figuring out how you're going to do something. It's not hard. It's just what materials am I going to use? What are the dimensions of what I'm going to build? How am I going to, you know, make this look like that? That type of thing. It, you know, it's just a, a process you need to go through to scratch build. So jump out there and play, you know, grab some materials. I, you know, you can do it for inexpensively. Um, you know, I'm cheap. <laughs> I'll use the word. Uh, I don't have a lot of money, you know, and I want to model a specific place in time. It's the only way for me to be able to do this is scratch build number one. And if these were a lot of these buildings were out there in kits, I couldn't afford to buy them. You know, uh, craftsman kits in today's world are just outrageous. Not to say that the people that design them aren't deserving of that kind of money for producing them, but oh my God, you know, you can have tens of thousands of dollars in buildings on a layout. You know, I'm not going to do that. I mean, you know, I'm just not going to do that. You know, I think some of the biggest buildings I had, I might have had $100 in, and they would have been three, $400 to buy kits like that, you know? So, you know, I'd rather spend money on trains. And again, I'd, I'd buy cheaper trains, and you know, older trains, not necessarily cheaper trains, but, you know, things that I'm not going to spend three or $400 on a locomotive or $540, $50 on a car, single car. To me, that's just nuts. I mean, if you got all the money in the world, man, have at it. Have all the fun you want. But, you know, I just don't have that kind of money, and I'm not going to do that. So, 
Anyway, I'm rambling on again. Thank you for coming back, coming back and sharing this time with me. Thanks for my new subscribers out there and picking up a couple each week or so. I uh, appreciate you joining my channel. I hope you can learn something from what I'm doing. Uh, but, you know, I just try to promote everybody to go out there and scratch build something. Play around, you know. It's not hard. And just enjoy the hobby, you know. Happy model railroading.